Oh, no. Well, hello, everybody. Oh, my God. So, it seems that the courier got us a little bit of a delivery today. Oh, boy. I can't wait. I can't wait to see what it is. Let's open it up, right? Oh, if it isn't hit video game Death Stranding by Hideo Kojima for the PlayStation 4. This game has been really, really highly anticipated for quite a while now. And I was more than pleased to finally start playing it last November. So I want to sit down and critique the game in depth. But I think that a lot of things have already been said about this game, and I want to avoid falling into the same pitfalls. So I've decided to segment my analysis in three. Number one, mechanically speaking, so let's see if it holds up as a game. Number two, from the point of view of the themes and aesthetic design of the game. And finally, from the point of view of the philosophy about the game. So, buckle up. Let's suit up for the ride. Oh, this is gonna be a this is gonna be a great one. Hideo Kojima and Guillermo del Toro's Death Stranding has been one of the weirdest and most fascinating video games I've ever played. It takes a lot of effort to summon the words to describe it while making it justice. However, after over 80 hours into it and close to a platinum, I feel that I have enough material now to talk about it in depth. Be wary that the following review will rip apart the story and the design of the game, so it will mention spoilers. If you haven't played the game, stop watching this and go play it. I recommend it. I recommend going in blind as I did. I never watch a single second of pre-release footage except the first gameplay trailer when the game was released and i think that i had a better time with it because i decided to go that way well as good of a time as you can have with dead stranding anyway introduction hideo kojima is a game director who together with joji shinkawa built the Metal Gear mediatic franchise through the 90s and 2000s. Metal Gear, in my opinion, proved that games could boldly embrace a third dimension and add production values up to wazoo to great effect. Sure, it's barbaric, sometimes it's ham-fisted, even juvenile, however a lot of people consider it a beautiful and engrossing game to no end. Metal Gear is an anime slash American work flick slash Tom Clancy war novel fever dream that's beloved by many. Its corny multi-hour cutscenes and lack of coherence notwithstanding in a way of amazing mechanic design. The titles are all-time greats in the gaming industry and the quintessential stealth game. Its characters and world are beloved by all with Solid Snake even being a part of the emblematic Super Smash Bros. franchise at this point even, by Kojima's request, actually. So everything is nice and dandy for Metal Gear Solid, and then the mobile game industry and the American game industry happen. Kojima Productions' parent company Konami decided to change directions in 2015, else get swallowed in the sea of capitalism. Trying to produce the most amazing open-world stealth game the Japanese industry has ever produced, Metal Gear Solid V. Disgruntled by constant delays, rising development costs, bad management, a demo that was sold at a full game price, Konami let go of Kojima in 2015 over creative differences. After the release of an undercooked Metal Gear Solid V, it got so bad even Hideo Kojima's name was scrubbed from the final product. So the plan is, get rid of Kojima, take the Fox engine, reuse it to try to recoup losses, power pachinko machines or something, and then pull the rest of your money into mobile games. That was the strategy. It was a cut and dry shift for Konami, and there goes the amazing Silent Hills, also known as PT, project, for which Kojima and his left pals 
Guillermo del Toro and Chummy Chummy Romance Norman Reedus of The Walking Dead fame were posed to create a single most thrilling and gruesome horror game yet. Many a tear were shed over the loss of such an amazing prospect. It was a title that had the potential to change the gaming landscape while reaching new depths in terms of what a video game could be. And even more, it's like rubbing salt on the wound because uh, we even managed to get a playable version of Silent Hills called PT, play playable teaser, which is no longer available for consumption anywhere. Uh, it used to be a downloadable title on the PlayStation 4, and now you cannot get it anymore, which is a bummer. So what happens with uh, the haphazard undercooked release of Metal Gear Solid 5 is that Metal Gear Solid 5 is an open world game. And uh, in my opinion, the Japanese gaming industry is not very good at open world games. They are kind of desperately trying to catch up with the rest of the world. Even Nintendo is getting into the party with the amazing Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and its upcoming sequel for which I'm very excited about. And even though it's a game that has glaring weak points, it is definitely a solid open world game, even if it pays as a Zelda game. When you compare Japanese open world games to examples such as Grand Theft Auto, Fallout, Elder Scrolls, or The Witcher, which are rife with sophisticated systems and chock full of content and production values, their games pale. There's a lot of catching up to do. You have to make a lot of concessions when playing Japanese open world games. And to continue this trend, we have Death Stranding now. After Kojima gets fired from Konami though, Sony Entertainment swoops in, picks him up, signs him a blank check, tells him to go bonkers. Kojima brought in all of his left friends, including, of course, Del Toro and Ritas, Matt Mikkelsen, Lea Sidux, from those five minutes of Blue is the Warmest Color that I actually gave a shit about, and he tries to develop a game that goes all indie and subvert the expectations like. By the way, Quick parenthesis, can we stop doing the subverting expectation shit? Uh, it was cute when Game of Thrones did it, but now everybody's doing it. So subverting the expectations is no longer subverting, in a way. But anyway. <laughs> Part 1. Make America Whole Again. That Stranding boils down to a not so thin veil nightmarish metaphor about current day Americana. You play as protagonist Sam Poor Bridges, played by Ritas, who's a disgruntled widow gig economy worker who lost his wife and child in a car accident. Now, Sam spends his days toughing it out, freelancing deliveries in post apocalyptic hostile USA, where all infrastructure has been eroded and has been taken over by strange meteorological phenomena and decay replacing it with weird, mutant, lush greenery, deep chasms, and acid rain that makes everything it touches age. Sam is beckoned by the late, morbid USA president, and his own mother, Bridget Strand, and tasks him to reconnect the world through the establishment of the Chiral Network, a peer-to-peer -peer futuristic evolution of the internet, which was developed through engineering advancements in the use of Chiralium, a substance which emerged in the world after a massive destruction event, the eponymous Death Stranding. The Death Stranding came from the discovery of a near-dead dimension called Beach, which Bridget Strand learned about after she fell ill with cancer and had a near-dead experience. After this, she commands more research on the beach, through a series of experiments made on stillborn fetuses known as the Bridge Babies, or BBs for short. These are found to represent a connection between the world of the living and the dead, and thus able to connect to the beach. However, chaos ensues. The experiments go wrong, and merge the world of the living with the dead. This causes masses of tar that spawn demons, structures, and dead people from underground. These spread all over America, and when these other worldly presences, known as the Beach Things or BTs for short, come in contact with living people, they cause a void out, 
a devastating nuclear explosion-like event that causes massive destruction. So things are looking grim. However, in the world of Death Stranding, not all is lost. Even though humanity is going through dire straits, and Kyrelium has a whole bunch of secondary effects, advancements in technology come from exploitation of Kyrelium. For example, Kyrelium is shown to help brewing beer by speeding up the process that creates it. Bridget Strand doesn't manage to convince Sam to work on the chiral network with her last wish, but his sister, Samantha Amelie Strand, who takes the baton after Bridget dies with the USA presidency, does. She has been taken hostage by Hicks, the leader of a terrorist organization, who, by the way, is portrayed by Troy Baker of Revolver Ocelot fame, and who leads a cult that seeks to destroy the world for good after the Death Stranding, under the basis that, since annihilation is unavoidable for the USA anyway, it shall be hastened and dealt with it ASAP. Sam reluctantly accepts to help Samantha and reveal the chiral network through much pain. She convinces Sam to travel from East Coast to West in what is Kojima's way to tribute um, American history, in a way. So, the premise of the game is to rebuild the USA through the establishment, first and foremost, of the Chiral Network. Since there's nothing of the USA left, the new country that will rise will be called the UCA, or the United Cities of America. A name that stems from the fact that in this new version of reality, nobody braves outside of cities anymore, rather holding themselves into shelters and into cities, because the reality outside of cities is way too hostile, and they are too much at the risk of running into a BT. Given how isolated people are from each other, a private company reaches its similarity to a certain other internet company that ships merchandise notwithstanding is established. Regis's tasks are twofold, to set up and maintain the Carol network, and to provide resources to people in need, since they cannot get them themselves in fear of running into BTs, provided with a cufflink and a cupid, the first of which is a device that can connect to the Carol network, and the second of which is a device which Sam can use to expand the coverage of the Chiral Network into a new knot, Sam sets for adventure. She also dons BB-28, which is a certain bridge baby, who supposedly was effective, but whom he picks up again and manages to connect with. Part 2 Game design for the man who has played it all. Straight from Guillermo del Toro's mind, and Hideo Kojima's mind. Death Stranding reflects their opinion on the current state of Americana, or how it is to live in the United States in the world of 2020. And what's powerful about it is that it communicates its points of view through really succinct uh, metaphors, and it makes game mechanics out of them. And I think that's pretty, and I think that's pretty awesome to see. I think that's indeed the value of the game. From start to finish, Dead Stranding is a shockingly single-player game in an era where the single-player game is going extinct. You'll never see another character in your game who is not an NPC. Most of the time, you will be communicated with other people through holograms that they project through the Carol network in what is a reference to video chat and how people communicate through the internet. Leveraging the level design framework that Zelda Breath of the Wild set a few years ago, which puts you in the middle of lush greenery and expects you to find tiny shrines spread throughout the terrain. That stranding consists in running errands while you connect knots into the chiral network. When you set forth to establish a new knot of the Chiral Network, you have to carry merchandise, both for your survival and for delivery to other people. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in those meetings, could you imagine? A lot of people in the design team were probably like, 
do, do you be what if? What, what if we make it a game about carrying weapons and stuff, like a, like a shooting game? But do you think it's silly that you can carry a whole arsenal with you at all times in video games? And that it doesn't really affect anything and that you can just produce them out of thin air at any given moment? What if we make it realistic and everybody was probably like, yeah, there is, yeah, for uh, It's like Shinji Mikami's Resident Evil 4 at a JK system. Taking to the extreme, of course. In Resident Evil 4, you don't have endless inventory space. Rather, you are provided with a fixed size grid where you have to place your items. So there's a meta game in terms of how you store your cargo through the campaign. You have to organize your inventory to maximize how many items you can carry within the grid of your attache case. You will basically be playing military Tetris in order to survive. Maybe I'm one of the less common cases here, but I love the attache case system and I love getting everything organized. But anyway, what I consider to be the first element of brilliance in that Stranding is that the inventory system influences the movement system. The weight of your cargo has actual weight in the game and uh, the weight that you distribute it and how much cargo you pile on Samson's back modifies how you actually can walk through the game. The game makes it so walking feels really realistic. If you walk downhill, Sam will start gaining momentum. Or likewise, if you're carrying a lot of cargo and you're going uphill, well, you're gonna have to modify your center of gravity to be able to make it. And I think that it is a joy to see a movement system that's so refined. That movement system is designed to be realistic while at the same time being entertaining enough. So it gives you a challenge while trying to balance the weight on your back. And I cannot avoid but feel that a massive amount of care and development time went into it. Every step, every time you trip, every time you jump, every time you swim, things feel really organic for lack of a better word. Most of the game believe it or not consists of this. There's been a lot of mentions that this game is a walking simulator, and what a lot of people oversee from it is that it's not just a walking simulator, it's a game where the walking was designed to be as engrossing as possible and as engaging as possible. One of the things that I like to do when I play video games is that I like to rotate the stick really quickly, no matter which video game we're talking about. And a lot of games uh, really show that they don't have a lot of thought put into it because the character would just like flinch or it would just glitch. It would show that the movement system was not something that got a lot of care. So Death Stranding, by making movement a first class citizen uh, in its game design, I think that it trumps on that area. The gameplay loop is the following. You depart from the nearest bridges distribution center. The idea is that you rest to prepare and to scout ahead what you're gonna do with the next leg of your trip. You're supposed to think ahead and decide on what resources, routes, and tools you're gonna need given the conditions in the road ahead, in terms of enemies, in terms of weather, and in terms of the topology. If you take the wrong kind of items for the expedition, you're gonna have a bad time. If you bear too little, you will be more nimble, but you will be vulnerable. If you take too much, you'll have to bear the burden awkwardly, but you may be better prepared in terms of items. You have to be crafty and to find ways to solve problems efficiently. The game allows you to solve problems in a lot of ways. One time I needed to cross a chasm with the motorcycle and I was at a loss because I didn't know what to do. So I thought maybe I can lay a ladder through it, through the chasm and ride the bike over it and I did it sort of expecting it to not work, and I was amazed when I found out that, oh my goodness, this did actually work, I actually solved the problem. And I think that this is one of the best parts about the game. Sometimes you will have to traverse areas that have BTs, or you will be attacked by mules, who are the obligatory generic enemy gang type kind of character, who will stop up nothing to steal your cargo. Except for some pre-scripted sequences, you normally can either stay and fight, or you can try to make a run for it. This part of the game loop also contributes to the whole allegory that the game is. BTs and mules hang out in ruins 
and tents. This is reminiscent in a very metaphorical way to the homelessness crisis in the USA. There's a reason why the BTs are designed so that you have to be stealthy and hold your breath when you walk around them to avoid getting detected. In what is an strangely gazy thing, because I guess this is a Hollywood sell-off that we're talking about and Kojima wanted to be cheeky or something, I don't know. BTs are only vulnerable to Sam's body fluids. When you rest at a distribution center, you can reuse your bath water, your urine, and excrement to produce grenades. By the way, what the fuck, Kojima? <laughs> I consider all of these a very underhanded jab at the fappening kind of deals which have happened in the past. Reader's even has a line in the game where he claims it's nothing private anymore. If you decide to start crafting weapons, to attack the BT, you must lace the projectiles with Sam's blood, so it is not possible to damage them otherwise. I think that this is a fantastic mechanic, because blood is your main HP or hit point kind of indicator. If you shoot too fast and too much, you will drain Sam out of blood, so you have to keep it in balance and carry additional blood bags besides your ammunition. I think this is a fantastic way to not introduce a simple cooldown effect like first person shooters do. Besides this, your BB, which you need to carry with you in your missions since it enables you to detect BTs, can become autotoxemic and you'll need to stop at a rest point if that happens so you can, I don't know, change his diaper? Remember, at any time, if you need to, you can cradle BB in your arms quite literally, you actually have to shake the dual shock to suit him. There's also a stamina system which slowly drains away as you run through the world. If you need, you can drink from your Estus flask, I mean a canteen full of monster energy drink of all things, in what is a blatantly obvious attempt at product placement. I mean, Kojima is no stranger to product placement. I think that all of us remember our calorie mates and our iPods and so on and so forth, right? From here, the game tries to complexify the gameplay loop. At every distribution center, you have a certain amount of materials available. These materials will allow you to craft items, which are of utmost importance, since they will enhance your abilities, allowing you to carry more weight, run faster, defend yourself better, or attack other people. At a point in time, you will even be able to craft vehicles, which will greatly enhance your abilities in traveling and in delivering cargo. A very important craftable item which you can create at distribution centers is the portable Cairo constructor, or PCC for short. In what is a bit of a nod to 3D printing technology, PCCs enable the player to construct infrastructure whenever there's Cairo network coverage. The amount of structures available to the player initially is rather limited, but as you perform more deliveries, you will have more structures available. All of your equipment and structures can and will get damaged through exposure to the elements or normal wear and tear, introducing another layer of complexity to the game. This creates an element of tension since you don't want to get caught in a BT attack with broken shoes or with bad equipment. The infrastructure system is one of the most interesting parts about the game, because it turns the game into a hybrid single-player, multiplayer kind of experience. Taking a page from the Souls games, everything that you build in the game will become available to other players that connect to your instance of the game. You can play signs to warn or advise other players about peril to come or about a certain route in the game world. Also, you can leave items and vehicles for other players at safe houses, post boxes and garages. And more than once, these resorts dug me out of ditches, so it felt like a blessing. There's few things as nice in the world as needing a specific kind of item running desperately, hanging to your life by a thread, and miraculously finding the exact kind of item you needed. Marvelous. This mechanic creates sort of a sense of responsibility. You feel like you owe it to yourself to create structures to make your playthrough easier, but also to create structures because the playthroughs of people that will come after you should be easier too. This is the second brilliant point about the game. The game has now become more about cooperation, 
collaboration, and being kind to other players, and less about gunplay and violence. What the game is going for is, again, <laughs> subverting the expectation about what a video game can be. Most video games just, res just boil down to uh, shooting people with guns. And Dead Stranding is a game that's vehemently pacifist. It tries to entice a player to solve problems in pacifistic ways. It is possible to clear out the game without killing a single person, really similar to what happens in Metal Gear Solid games, mind you. At the beginning of the game, there's a quote that is uh, shared with the player, that if you research human civilization, no matter which civilization you're looking at in its early stages, the first artifacts that show up in them are sticks and ropes. Uh, sticks are things to keep the undesired away, to defend yourself, to set a perimeter. And rope is an artifact which allows you to, to keep that which is desired closer to you. It allows people to make bridges. It allows people to uh, hurt animals. A, a, a big part of the of the spirit behind the game uh, starts with this. It's a game about the rope or the strand, a term that will be mentioned tens of times throughout the game. It's a game about bringing things together. And Kojima has never been shy when talking about the inspiration for the game, bringing up facts as in, well, the world is more connected than ever now. Yet, people have found that this is not desirable for them, so they're setting up barriers and disconnecting from each other. There's things such as the Brexit vote, there's the Donald Trump election, uh, there's the border wall. So all of those things are representations of the stick, as in trying to keep our things out. A lot of this comes from the fact that the internet is readily available to everybody now. And since everybody is plugged into the network, everybody is starting to think that way. So it's a game that tries to revert that tendency and telling people that the internet can be used for connection and that hopefully that's going to be the meta for the years to come. Part 3. The Inferno the Same. Now televised. In what is again a very subtle metaphor about the postmodern world with its social networking shenanigans, Dead Stranding, cheekily, introduces an element in the chiral network in the form of likes. When you run across somebody else's structures or items, you can leave them likes similar to how you like people's pictures on social media. Now, as everybody will know, Kojima is no stranger to philosophy. Everybody will remember Metal Gear Solid 2's section with the Patriots' declamatories about how the overabundance of information is gonna systematically be used to model, regulate, and control society's path forward. Kojima didn't predict this. Rather, he's known to read authors and to use that knowledge in his games. I am convinced that Kojima is familiar with German-Korean philosopher Byung Chun Hal and his commentary on postmodernity and the information society. Two very popular treatises of his, which I actually urge all watchers to read and get familiar with, are The Burnout Society and The Agony of Eros, and I think that both of these bled into that stranding. Across both of these, Chulhan establishes the concept of the erosion of the otherhood, the rationalization of love, and the advent of rampant, vicious individualism and its consequences on the psychology of the postmodern individual. I think that it, it's not a coincidence that one of the items that you can get in the game is a hood in the shape of another, rather, an other hood. I think that it is literally making allusion to this. So first, in the Burnout Society, Chulhal argues that the information society has established the effigy of the performance object. It is not enough to live in the information society on its own, but rather 
you have to perform or you have to show if you're not trying to overachieve or for deliver or produce something or show something you lose value in the information society he claims that the main directive in people's life has switched from the must do or rather the should be of things and instead frames it in terms of the can do he compares this to the philosophy of the yes we can kind of mentality he argues that as a method of controlling society this is even better than slavery or forced labor because people are led to self-exploit as much as possible for capital gain presence and appreciation if you're not constantly pushing yourself for bigger and better projects being more productive gaining more and advancing more you're at a loss in true hands vision of society don't you feel that everybody is always in a hurry always tired no time to sit down and relax and recreate only busy in producing and consuming things don't you feel that even in your free time you are pushed to take on personal projects and to achieve things even if as menial as tracking your fitness on a fitness app don't you feel that at work people are constantly trying to pile more and more onto you and that work always has to be done under pressure that deadlines get shorter and shorter every time and the product has to ship faster as if everybody was on a treadmill that is constantly speeding up have you worked over time or more hours than usual lately or do you feel that in general your responsibilities just seem to pile up more and more and more well this is Chulhan's performance subject clearly manifested i think that it's no coincidence for this that the main token of appreciation and the currency in the game of source is social media likes which display comfortably as a grand total every time you post the game social media is something that's very valuable to the performance subject Chulhan argues that in today's information society viciously driven by capital gain status and service orientation where people are always connected through the internet with the massive practicality yearing personality that it implies always isolated but always connected he claims that this leads to issues with mental health which is degrading and instead has mutated into narcissism and inability to relate to other people exclusively on the basis of whether they are similar convenient or profitable to oneself then in the burnout society he argues that all of this process of flattening abstracting accessibilizing and commodifying reality on the first and foremost basis of their appeal to the self leads to what he calls the inferno of the same he argues that the inferno of the same is replacing the concept of the good life the life that is worth living he claims the ontological other is the antithesis to the inferno of the same unexplored different and delivered through the errors and chaos of life the other is utopia the delivery from the inferno of the same is atopia in the agony of errors Chulhan explores more about the death of romantic love and how romantic relationships are not of high priority to the performance subject unless if that leads to gain capital otherwise he claims that all of this has created a rationalization of love which makes most people in post modernity feel lonely even if they are always connected to other people always on and always participating part four you are not alone so the remainder of the plot follows sam in his lonely adventure across the usa as he makes connections with people to make them join the uca and eventually reignite the broken american soul through your journey you will meet a lot of clients as you deliver cargo for people your connection level with them increases and if they are really fond of sam they will present him with gifts and niceties which are part of the character progression system their characterizations are really fun you get a small taste of what their lives are like you get to hear what they have to say and you get to know a little bit about their personalities their hopes and dreams and their lives besides your clients there's an amazing cast on set 
that plays a part in the lives of every member of the Bridges staff to a certain extent. You meet Emily, who is Sam's sister, and who Sam is fond of because she saved him from a near-death experience in the beach when he was a child. Frial, who is an entrepreneur, and Bridges Competition, who's got a chip on her shoulder and a statement to make after Higgs rebelled against her with a terrorist ploy, which tarnished her reputation and killed her father, Mama, and her long-lost sister Lokna, who's your Cortana-type character throughout the game and who tragically lost her child when pregnant due to a terrorist attack commanded by Higgs. Hartman, a man with a heart ailment who dies for 3 minutes every 21 minutes to research the beach and trying to find his long lost family who died in a terrorist attack. Batman, who is kind of a Frankenstein kind of monster whose body is 70% made out of dead body matter and who longs for companionship and a sense of belonging without a family or a place to call his own. And Die Harman, aka the most badass video game name ever who used to be a high-ranking official in the US military and who was saved by a very particular soldier, Clifford Unger, back in the day, who also comes into play. Clifford Unger is a soldier who manifests in chiral phenomena as a and is looking for his BB. It seems that Sam's BB number 28 is the BB that Cliff is trying to find desperately. More about Cliff in a bit. So as the plot progresses and you finally make it west and recover Amelie from Higgs's hand, which by the way happens in a Metal Gear Solid style mano a mano kind of fight, life bars on the HUD included and all, it is then revealed by a defeated Higgs that not only it turns out that Amelie is not real after all, but rather that she's the spirit or the ha, as the game calls it, of Bridget Strand. Turns out that the physical Bridget Strand was only the ka or the physical presence, and her ha has been stuck on the beach for an eternity, waiting to fulfill her purpose, which is to annihilate humanity. Hartman's studies eventually reveal that life on Earth has undergone massive extinctions which he calls extinction events. Every extinction event has been brought upon by an extinction entity, and it's a way for reality to clean the slate and undo life. It is revealed eventually that Amelie is the next extinction entity, and that her next extinction is unavoidable. So in a very amazing ending, Sam finds a way to travel to the beach to meet with Amelie, and persuade her to not trigger the next extinction. The game gets really amazing and really creative here, because the gameplay gets stuck in a loop until you find a way to get out of it. You're given a gun and you're told to try to stop Amelie, but violence will not work. She's invulnerable to gunshots and there's nothing you can really do with that gun. In the end, the only way to stop the extinction event from happening is through connecting with her. Sam runs desperately towards her and overcomes his fear of touching. He prefers to be close to her. He has aphemosophobia, the fear of being touched, because whoever touches him produces a very bad rash on his skin. And through making a connection, Sam stops extinction, even though Amelie claims that this is only temporary and extinction is unavoidable. So, in what is a very creative credit, credit sequence, you get stuck on the beach for around 20 minutes and you have to walk senselessly. You walk until you get tired and you get a story exposition. Then you have to start the process all over again and you, and you get a more story exposition here and so on and so forth. And I think this is very poetic because it sort of ties the whole package together comparing it to the Sisyphean myth. In my opinion, this is the maximum of the game, and something that is really inspiring. What is the point of everything if it is nothing but toil, nothing but suffering and pain, and if extinction is unavoidable? Why should we care? But if you manage to make it through all the chaos and madness of it all, Sam is rewarded with small 
pleasing moments of bliss. There's these really brief moments where everything is going well for you and the scenery is uh, hauntingly beautiful uh, and the trip ahead is really easy and simple. And those moments of joy, I think that they are the reward of the game. Much like real life, if you're tasked with a responsibility, your only concern is to get it done. And the reward for doing it and for doing it well is to get to do it again and even faster and more over and more over and more over. But, however, as Albert Camus writes about in his analysis of the myth of Sisyphus, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. I think that's kind of the philosophy that the game wants to tell people that uh, the life of the modern uh, adult, responsible adult, involves a lot of effort, a lot of working, a lot of responsibilities, a lot of burden, which is materialized literally through the cargo that Sam has to bear on his back. Yet, we have to see it as a challenge because uh, giving up is not an option. Like Sisyphus, who he is damned to carrying the stone up the mountain forever, yet gets a little bit of self-satisfaction once he reaches his goal at the top. That's the same way that we gotta see life as a challenge that has to be undertaken and that leads to small moments of joy. I gotta say that I love how well attuned all of that is to the modern discourse and that somebody's trying to bake that into a video game, not only through its narrative, but through its mechanic design. After you fight a VT or after you deliver a bunch of pieces of cargo, sometimes Sam is literally tired. And this leads to a lot of really meditative and really cool moments, which I actually enjoyed quite a lot. The highest point of the game for me was the Asylums for the Feeling sequence, where I think all of these ideas and everything that the game is uh, aiming for gets achieved in its maximum way. There's a certain part of the game where you have to go uphill and you get ambushed by BTs on top of the hill, so you have to fight them. So the game is a sign that you're gonna walk away probably with all most of your equipment, if not all of it, uh, in shambles, uh, with way too little blood in reserve, uh, with, an, with a sick baby, because your baby can get sick. And as you walk downhill, Asylums for the Feeling starts playing, which was one of the main themes uh, that was used in the original trailers. The way that the game presents this scenario is so brilliant and so captivating that it made me feel, feel a, a little bit misty-eyed. As in, look at this guy, he's self-exploiting to try to achieve something. Look at him, he's, he's in other suffering he is miserable and everybody can relate and when i play through that walking towards my destination and my shoes have been broken my feet started bleeding uh because of that a, a, a touch which i think was also brilliant as, as all of that happened to the tune of this uh beautiful piece of music well i look at sam porter and i and i and i i, I empathize i felt as if I know how it feels, Sam, because, yeah, I know how it feels to go through, to be, to be put through the ringer, you know? Which I think is something that was written in this way to appeal to how prevalent feelings of nihilism and hopelessness are in a lot of people these days. In the grand conclusion of the game, Sam meets Cliff Unger in one of the Carol phenomena, and he discovers that not only he was not going after BB-28, but rather the BB that Clifford was going after was Sam himself, and Clifford was stuck in a Carol phenomena where he was reliving his last memories over and over. Sam manages to communicate with Cliff Unger, who eventually reveals that he is indeed his father. He gives him his blessing and he tells him that he is now Sam Bridges, the bridge to the future. A person that will bring people together. The person who is able to bring people together. One of the most emotive and best written 
video game cutscenes that I've ever seen in my life. Die Hard Man unfortunately had to follow commands and assassinate cliffhanger, which is why he had a lot of longing and continued to manifest in chiral phenomena trying to look for his lost son. Sam, as a BB, gets caught in a crossfire and unfortunately dies. Since however, Sam was part of the BB experiments and is discovered to be a repatriate, that is, somebody who is able to resurrect from the dead, because the Ha of Bridget Strand, which was on the beach, heals him back to life. Sam eventually comes back alive and is adopted as Bridget's own, who raises him as her child. That's the ability that has powered Sam's adventure so far. He cannot die. When he dies, he's thrown into the seam, the fringe area between the beach and the afterlife, but his soul is able to return to his body eventually returning him to the world of the living through this. Die Hard Man also comes through, confessing his actions to Sam and apologizing to him, but redeeming himself by taking up the post as the new president of the UCA and taking the baton after Amelie. In the climax of the game, Sam comes full circle. Sam has to dispose of BB-28 because he flatlines. In what is also a very emotive scene, he manages to resurrect it and eventually baptizes it Lou or Louise because it turns out that he was a girl all along. Kudos to Matt, Readers and Tommy Earl Jenkins for their superb acting in these scenes. I'm happy to see the state of the art in regards to video game cutscenes and I'm happy to see where it leads to next. In conclusion, what I will think about Death Stranding is that Death Stranding is an experience that is most definitely worth it, but a lot of things about it, mechanically speaking, are kind of dated and the game itself seems as if it could have used an additional gear or so in the oven. There's literally a lot of times where I got some constants displayed on screen, uh, which obviously had a floating point calculation error. You see such numbers such as, yeah, you have 0.9999999999 pieces of some kind of material, which is incredibly daring to see in a professional production such as that. Also, some things about the game are kind of choppy. It's not the game being harsh on you to, to deliver a point or because it has a message to convey. It is just the game not being tested. It is more than likely that you can walk out of a vehicle once you, when you start using vehicles. You can get stuck between a wall and the vehicle itself. Uh, and there's a lot of times where I've had to reset the game because it just dumps you somewhere or it just leaves your cargo in an awkward position where you literally cannot retrieve it or I think that a little bit more playtesting would have been a little bit better even though the delivery mechanic is intended to play into the metaphor that people are too isolated from each other and only getting the resources to deliver through whatever stuff from the internet um, I think that it would have been better to try to come up with some kind of richer mechanic because I don't think that you can base 40 hours of a game ex almost exclusively on fetch quest, which is which is what what it basically is. But major props, however, on the um, on the movement system, which I think is the highest point of the game. This was incredibly designed. And every time that I play through a scenario with it, uh, it, it was a joy to play through. Great experience. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's that great of a video game. I think that it has a lot to say, and that's what makes it worth it. But your mileage may vary. For what it's worth, I think that it's no coincidence that after that, I kind of went back to Grand Theft Auto V. I think this is everything for now. Thank you so much for tuning in today, like and subscribe, and remember, we're all in this together, so let's keep making connections with each other, and maybe we'll become better through it. And now if you excuse me, I think that's my Uber Eats delivery person right there. Have a good one.